So firstly, I'm sorry that we're starting late. I apologize. I have to sew up all the pieces. I have all the pieces I think sewn up. So this is what we're going to do tonight. Just so you know before we do it, to have clarity and to know what we're going to do. We're actually going to be trying to understand something that Rashi says in this week's Torah portion, which has bothered me my whole life. I never figured it out. I could not understand why Rashi says this because it seems overly and overly simple. Just because it's not saying anything. So in order to understand and better appreciate what Rashi says in this week's Parsha, we're going to take a look and see what Rashi says in Parsha's Bo, which is back in the book of Exodus, which also talks about tefillin, and we're going to compare the two. When we, when we compare the two, it's going to compound the question, and then we're going to start to peel away the layers of the meaning of tefillin. And when we understand the difference between the two sets of tefillin, the handset and the headset, we'll come into a new appreciation of the mitzvah of tefillin, what it represents, what it's supposed to accomplish, and then everything else will fall into place. Now Rashi says one thing there and something else here. Okay? So let me just tell you the two, the two psukim we're going to have to go back and forth from, from today. And the psukim, the verses that we're going to study together in this week's Torah portion, which is Parshas Vaz Chanon, Deuteronomy 6, and we're going to be taking a look at verse 8. You should be very familiar with this verse. You'll, you'll, you'll keep it open your book, open your Chumash Dvarim first. I don't know what page. Chapter 6, verse 8. Chapter 6, verse 8. Chapter 6, verse 8 should be very familiar to you because this is part of the Shema that we recite twice daily, one more time. Chapter 6, verse 8. The Shema. Yeah, yeah, it's the Shema. It's the Shema. And I hope that you'll have a new appreciation and understanding of this portion of the Shema forever as a result of our class. Can everybody see verse 8? 82. This is, this verse is the origin of the mitzvah of Tefillin. It's the origin. What's, what does it say in the Torah? Ukshartam le'ot al yedecha. You will tie a sign on your hand. Which will translate as frontlets. Between your eyes. Pretty simple. So what is an oat? And what is a totafot? We don't know. The only way we might know this is if God tells us somewhere. But nowhere in the scripture does he tell us. And that's because the scripture, the Chumash, the Tanakh, without the oral tradition, without the Mishnah, the Gemara, the Safra, Safri, Mechilta, the Medrash, without the oral tradition, Torah Shabbat Torah, Shabbat the scripture, the written Torah, is a closed book. So you read about all these things, but you don't know what to do. Really, in any mitzvah. No mitzvah is clearly delineated and spelled out. So the origin, the source of all the mitzvahs, is in the Chumash itself. The understanding of how we do this mitzvah is in the oral Torah. The Rambam, Maimonides, in his introduction to his magnum opus, the Mishnah Torah, he says, he calls it HaTorah VaHamitzvah. He calls the scripture the Torah, the instructions. He calls the oral tradition, the oral Torah, he calls it the mitzvah. Why is it the mitzvah? That's very simple, because you can't do anything without the oral tradition. So the oral tradition tells us that this oat, that this sign, is a box that's made of leather, that's hollow, that has writings, specific scriptural writings for Parshia to be exact, because Tefillin is mentioned four times in the Torah, and that it has to have leather straps made in a specific way and it has to be tied to your arm. And it talks about totafot. In the oral tradition, totafot are also a box made of leather, but actually it's a one box that's comprised of four boxes. And the four boxes are pressed together. And there are four individual compartments that have the same four parchments or the same four parshiot, scriptural paragraphs that are written on one parchment. And your hand fill it, are written on four separate parchments and inserted in four separate compartments and are placed on your head. And that's a mitzvah. That's a mitzvah that every Jewish male has. We generally start to observe this mitzvah from the age of? 13. 13 years old. Why? Because tefillin require reverence. It's like wearing Hashem in your body. So there are two major male mitzvahs. With, with, without these mitzvahs, a male is majorly deficient, a Jewish male. And these are brit milah and the mitzvah of tefillin. So women don't need these mitzvahs. 
Why? Because they have a natural connection to Hashem that doesn't require that additional effort. Although, when it comes to Brit Milah, we say the Gemara clearly says, Nashim command the Mihili Damia. That women have the virtue or benefit of a Brit Milah without having a Brit Milah. Chas v'shalom, that women should be harmed or hurt, or it has to do with certain faith systems, Chas v'shalom. Um, it's a, a male thing specifically, and a woman doesn't require it. And with regard to tefillin, a woman does not require tefillin. However, it should be noted that if a man doesn't put on tefillin, he not only robs himself, he robs his wife too. Okay. This should be known. Yeah. Can you put on tefillin if you don't wear tzitzis? Does it affect do they go Can you put on tefillin if you don't wear tzitzis? The answer is certainly yes, the two separate mitzvahs. Why do people wear talus and tefillin? This is in order to honor the davening or suit up for davening, but actually the two separate mitzvahs. So let's take a look now in Rashi. This would seem to be abundantly simple. Kshartim le'ot al yadecha means tie a sign on your hand. So which tefillin is that going to be? Your hand tefillin. And then it says totafot bein einecha, between your eyes. It's going to be in your head. Your eyes are in your head. Where exactly you had the oral tradition. So I want you to take a look in Russia. My whole life does it bother me. Until <laughs> I think, figured it out today. So Rashi says, Ukshartim Laot al Yadecha. Rashi says something very f- profound, mm-hmm. a real shocker. He says, Tie a sign on your hand, Elu Tfilin Shebizroa. This is the Tfilin on your arm. I wonder what I would do if Rashi didn't help me there. <laughs> I wonder what we would do if Rashi would not have commented here. He wouldn't say, Ukshartim le'ot al yadecha. He wouldn't say anything. What would you think? And then he says, V'hayu le'tetofet be'nenecha. He says, Elu, these are tefillin, sheva rosh, the tefillin of the head. So the simple question that I put to you today is, why in heaven's sake did Rashi have to say that? Whose question did he answer? We know that when Rashi has nothing to say or doesn't feel there's a need to say anything, he doesn't say anything. When Rashi feels that there is something in the scripture that demands elucidation, but he doesn't have a clear pshuto shal mikra answer, which is a certain style, a certain approach that Rashi creates a tapestry of called the straightforward interpretation. If there is something that begs interpretation, and Rashi doesn't know a straightforward interpretation, <coughs> he will not give you an allegoric or midrashic interpretation. A number of times he says, any idea, I don't know. I believe that there is pshuto shal mikra for every question in the entire Chumash. There's a few I didn't figure out. Even though there are answers to these questions, but not in pshuto shal mikra, not in the straightforward understanding of the verse. And then there are lots of verses that Rashi doesn't say anything about. The other commentators speak about because pshuto shal mikra. There's no difficulty here. There's no issue. If there's no issue, Rashi doesn't say anything. Mm-hmm. He doesn't interpret every word. For example, in the next word, in the, the, uh, let's take a look at a verse, a verse ahead, verse ten. Vahayaki viecha Hashem el haaretz. God will bring you to the land. What does Rashi say? What does he say? Nothing. Why does he say anything? What is the question? Which what don't you understand? Vahaya will come to pass. God will bring you El Haaretz to the land. Which land? Oh, look in the in the pasuk. Look in the verse. Asher Nishba Secha that was forsworn to your forefathers. La Abraham li Yitzchak li Yaakov. What did he tell them? La Tetlahem that he would give them Arim, Gdolim, large cities, Vitovot, good cities. Asher lo Fanita. Now Arim Gdolot. Arim Gdolot Asher lo Fanita. I want to tell you a little secret. Arim Dolot V'tavot Ashalot Banita does not say anywhere in Chumash Bereshis. It says, I'll give you this land. It doesn't exactly say that God made this promise, but whatever, that's, that's what's going to happen, and you're going to get this land as I promised it. Rashi doesn't say anything. On the other hand, it says, Ukshartam Leot Al Yadecha, not Al Zrootecha. Yeah, okay, fine. Well, so, there, there's a difference. Yadecha, Yadecha, Zrootecha, Zrootecha. Uh, un- understood. So Rashi's coming to tell us that this is the film of the Zerah and not what? Why not here? If it says Al Yadech. Rashi no, doesn't I... go into the details of putting on film. He doesn't talk about straps. He never says that they're black. He never says they're square. He never says they require parchment. He doesn't give you any details. Why does it suddenly have to tell you exactly where it's placed? And where it's Al Zerah? Is this my Zerah? 
It is. Mm -hmm. So that put on film here, it is okay? No. Why not? It says film al Azra. Wow. Because <laughs> Rashi <laughs> doesn't really explain where to put on the film here. That's not the place for it. You look at the Gabar of Menachas, you find a way to put on the film. Rashi of Menachas talks about that. I'll soon share with you Rashi's commentary on the Gemara of Menachas. So what did Rashi say over here? We know that there's a concept of hand film and head film. The child who's five years old has been to show before. He's seen people davening. He knows he doesn't wear film, but he knows what film are. He's seen film. He knows there's handset and headset. He probably didn't use that terminology. Film shal yad, film shal resh. Okay. So when he reads, Ukshartim la'isal yadecha, it's self-understood. He says, okay, yeah, that makes sense. That's the hand film and the head film. Why would Rashi feel a need to say this? So there is a commentary called Masiyah Ilmin. Masiyah Chilman says like this. He says, you might have thought, you might have thought that it's the same sign. That you'll tie it as a sign on your hand and as a frontlet, it'll be a frontlet on your head. So maybe you would think you put, take, take the phone, first wrap it on your hand and then afterwards take it off your hand and then put it on your head. So first of all, with all due respect to Masiyah Chilman, to me, it sounds like scratching your left ear with your right hand. Why would I even think that? You have to have a twisted mind to think that the Torah calls it two different names. Ukshatim la'ot al yadecha is the hayu, and that oat will be the totofat benenecha. But the biggest question on the Messiah Chilman is that this is not the first time the Torah mentions tefillin. And Rashi has a rule. He never repeats himself twice. He never repeats himself twice. That means if there's a need for some kind of elucidation, he'll say it the first time around. And if he made the explanation or clarification at one point, he expects you to remember from last time. Okay. Every word is precise and exact. So now I want you to open up to the book of Exodus. I'll tell you, we're gonna do a, a study of two different. I'm gonna ask you to go to Exodus 13, nine. Chapter 13, verse nine, which is the end of Parsha's bow. Now, incidentally, the mitzvah of tefillin is mentioned twice in Parshas, in Parshas Bo. It's mentioned here in verse 9, and then if you go forward, it's mentioned again in verse 16. In verse 16, Rashi says nothing about the hand and the head. He gives us, he talks about the idea of totafot. Because it's the first time totafot shows up. So he talks about what totafot are. But the first time tefillin were ever mentioned to the Jewish people was before they left the land of Egypt. Moshe Rabbeinu gave them a number of mitzvahs. And one of the mitzvahs, which is going to be Zechel Yitzhiat Mitzrayim, is the mitzvah of putting on tefillin. So verse 9 says, V'hoyo l'cha le'ot al yadecha, o l'zikaron be'ninecha. It'll be a remembrance on your arm, and a sign on your arm and a remembrance between your eyes. So what does Rashi say? Al yodecha ule zikaron beninecha. Rashi very interestingly does not transcribe the words ot al yodecha. He says it will be an ot that refers to Yitziat Mitzrayim. Yitziat Mitzrayim will be an ot, a sign. And it will be Al Yodcha Ulazikoron Ben Inecha. It'll be on your arm and in remembrance between your eyes. Says Rashi. Roitzaloimar. What he means to say at this point in the scripture is Shetichtov Parshiot Halalu. You will write these verses of scripture, which he does not repeat later on in Deuteronomy, because he already told you here you're going to be writing something. And you will tie them to your head and to your arm. So the child will learn Chumash. Red Parsha's bow, he already knows that there's going to be something tied to his arm and something tied to his head. In one place it uses, uh, in Shmot it uses the singular, whereas in Dvarim it uses the plural. It says, Vehaya the ot al yadecha, corresponding to the uh, Vehaya lo I'm not talking about the film. We'll soon talk about that. You means it shall be. We'll, we'll talk about it. So Rashi already told us that this has to be tied to your hand and to your arm. 
And if the Masiyah Ilnim is right, that we have a concern, that maybe you have to tie the same tefillin to your arm and your head, then it would seem to me Rashi should have mentioned something early on in verse 13, the first time, when he says, Tikshurim, Bereshu Bezreim. And since he said, tie it to your head and to your hand, it should be self-understood to tie it to your head. And your hand is two different things. And if it wasn't, you'd have to spell it out there. So, it doesn't work for me. The, the Messiah Chilmam does not answer my question. It doesn't really explain to me why Rashi has to say this. I also, also want to point out to you that in Rashi's commentary, he switches the order. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. In verse, in, in verse uh, chapter 13, Exodus 13, verse 9, it says, Alva, and then Lizikaron Beninecha. Rashi reverses the order and he says, Tikshrim Barosh Ubezroa. And what's even stranger is that not only Rashi departs from the order that it's said in the scripture, but in fact, that's not the way we put on the film. First, you put on the film of the hand, and only yeah. afterwards, you put on the film of the head. Right. So, why did Rashi reverse the order? So, this is. These are, this is the questions that we're going to try to answer tonight. And the real question, the real issue, is just trying to understand our Parsha, this week's Parsha. And invariably, in understanding this week's Parsha, we will come to a new understanding of tefillin. So far, everybody's with me? Mm -hmm. Lose anybody? Okay. So let's talk for a moment about, is tefillin really about hand and eyes? Is that, is that the buzzword here? Because it says, it says, Yodcha and Beni Necha. It says bain, that in Exodus, bain, bain. I understand. And it says that here, right? There's the, the body parts mentioned are hand yeah. and eyes. That's the body parts mentioned. Okay. So the Balaturim, in our, in our Pasuk, in Pasuk Veschana, he says that the word Yodcha, mm -hmm. Yod Dalad Chav, which comes out to be 34, he says, Yodcha is the gematria of Gova Hayad, the high point of the hand. Which is really a quote from Mesechet Menachot on page 37b. And over there, the Gemara says, Tanarabanan, al Yodcha, zo Gova Shabiyad. This is the high point of the hand. Incidentally, Rashi in the Gemara in Menachas on page 37, he says, Kiboret. Kiboret means? The muscle, the biceps. Yeah. The have eight salakosif, the biceps that are up here next to the shoulder. So it means goiva hayad means that you have the high point of the muscle is round, it's domed. So at the high point of that muscle, this is where the tefillin have to go. So from the beginning, it's important for us to establish that the issue here is not the hand, but more the high part of the hand, which of course we're going to see is close to the heart. He says totafos. Totafos, the word totafos, the way it's written, you have testagin. You have nine different little crowns that are drawn on the word totafot. Do you ever see what totafot looks like? Like these little hairline projections with a circle on top. And he says that corresponds to nine different body parts in the head. I'm not sure what he's talking about, but that's what he says. And this is uh, something which is found in other sources as well. So in other words, in the words, totafot, there's an emphasis not on eyes, but rather on, yeah. on head. In the words of the Sefer Achinuch, who very interestingly does not talk about the mitzvah of tefillin in Parsha's bow, but rather talks about the mitzvah of tefillin only in Parsha's bow et Hanan, the Sefer Achinuch says that the mitzvah of the tefillin ideally is supposed to be on the left arm, and he says, after they're tied on the arm, the tefillin are supposed to lie against the heart. And that's what's called tefillin shalyad. It's called tefillin shalyad because it's placed on the, on the, on the, on the hand, but the, the focus is not hand. The focus is the heart. And he says this is because a person naturally is always drawn after their heart. Heart takes them in different directions. Their heart lusts and desires and craves and yearns for things, and many of them are toxic and unhealthy. And if people would just do whatever their heart feels, this world would be a scary place. Well, actually, it is a scary it's place. Happy. <laughs> <laughs> think of it. A lot of people aren't putting it on and doing whatever they want. Right. So, so that's what the tefillin is supposed to do. It's supposed to inhibit 
the power of the heart. Now let me take you forward to the next mitzvah, which is the tilm of the head. And let me share with you the words of the Sefer Achinuch, who says that we were commanded to place these, these mitzvahs, these, these, these mitzvahs, these artifacts. He says, to place them between our eyes, on the head, obviously, and on the tablet of our heart, which means it's resting right against our heart. And he says, these are the two, I think limbs would be the wrong word, um, two organs, the two organs of the body that that the naturalists or scientists will tell you that this is Mishka Naseichel, this is where consciousness resides. That human consciousness resides in the head and in the heart. And if you want to use psychological terminology, we say people's intellect and people's emotions. We are all conglomerate of intellect and emotion. There are certain people who don't have emotions. They're very sick. They're not well. There are people who are very, can be very brilliant. Generally, that condition is referred to as autism. The person has a, a mind, but has no heart, can't relate. So the person may not ever cry, may not, doesn't know how to empathize, doesn't know how to relate. There's a huge spectrum of autism. You know, there was that story about the, the Israeli boy who was calling in these bomb threats all over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Last year. US called him German. So the, 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 one of the interviews, the father was saying that this boy once was riding a bicycle and he hit a pole, like a, like a telephone pole. Yeah. And he didn't cry. Like he, didn't have a, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't express himself. He didn't, he didn't even cry when he was in pain. Yeah. He, was, he, was a very, he was a very sick boy. He's, he's really not well. And there are some people that have an incredible emotions. Incredible, but they have no intelligence. Their, their, their intelligence never, like, doesn't mature past age, sometimes four or five, six years old. So they remain like a six-year-old child, like Down's, Down syndrome children, or like six-year-old children. They have amazing hearts. They're full of love. They're full of emotion. Mm. And they hug and they kiss, and they, but mm. there's no intelligence. So that's not okay. That's, that's, that's never not normal. That's, a normal person needs to have, in order to have normal human consciousness, what they need to have? They need to have mind and heart, which are understood to be the, the place of the, where the intellect resides and where the emotions reside. And it's kind of universal. Everybody talks about the heart when they feel, everybody talks about thinking with their mind. So the Zefer Achinuch says essentially, the mitzvah of tefillin was designed to do something positive to our consciousness change our consciousness, to change the way we function. So we have a body which is very complex and filled with all kinds of fancy machines, like a liver and lungs and the intestines and so on and so forth. And the truth is that animals have similar machines and sometimes they can actually take pieces of the machine from an animal and put it into a person and, and it works quite well. Uh, there are many people who today have pig valves in their heart, and that's how the hearts are functioning, and that works. The one thing that no animal has is human consciousness. Even science, which prefers to see us on the continuum of mammals, of warm-blooded mammals, has to call us the homo sapien, right? That's the technology that we have, this intelligence. But the intelligence is not just it's emotional intelligence. EQ is as human as IQ is. Animals don't have EQ or IQ. So emotional cordians and intellectual cordians this is what makes a human being a human being. And so essentially our humanity becomes harnessed and channeled by virtue of the mitzvah of tefillin. Yes, so far with me? I'll share with you uh, another, some interesting words. The Reish's Chochma in Shara Chochma, Shara Kedusha, pardon me, in Pedic Zion. He says, quote, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that Almighty God commanded us that we should put the tefillin on our arm and on our eyes because the tefillin shall yad, the handset, the hand tefillin, are keneged halev, correspond to the heart. Shall rosh keneged hamoach, it's, 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 it's right up in front of the prefrontal cortex, where people think. Where people, this is where the intelligent part of the brain, the creative part of the brain, incidentally, is soft when we're very, very small. And the skull then 
hardens and fills in as we get older. And that prefrontal cortex, that's where the moyach is. And him shnei ha'ivarim ha'chashuvim b'yoyser shal ha'adam. These are the two most powerful things a human being possesses. The two most powerful possessions are his mind and his heart. Otherwise, he could just be a chimpanzee. He could have a functioning liver. He could have a functioning digestive system. He could have machines that work. He can be a living piece of flesh. But what makes him human is his consciousness. And he says, Actually, even terrestrial life, even physical life, is entirely in the mind and in the heart. The two most severe conditions that could strike a person, Rahman al Islam, is heart failure or stroke. The stroke is in the brain, heart failure is in the heart. Right? So heart can come with a sudden heart failure or they can have a congestive heart, fa heart failure where the heart is just giving out. And either way, a person can't function without a heart. Now, they've actually figured out how to replace a heart because the heart is just a valve. It's a big pump. Although it has a little brain attached to it that knows what it's doing also. The brain, you can't have any brain transplants. That's so yet. certainly not yet. We don't, we don't know what that is. So now, because they are the two most important organs, he says, this is how a person thinks. This is how a person functions. The Rishis Chachma says, this goes in a toivais, in a rois. Be it good or bad. We are good when we choose right, when we do what Hashem wants. We are bad when we go against Hashem and do what Hashem says is wrong. And invariably, the choices are made with brain and heart. Most important part. Brain and heart. This is a brain and heart mitzvah. This is essentially about harnessing human consciousness. And the very fact that women are not required to put on film speaks volumes about the feminine ability to channel and harness consciousness that men simply don't have. Because if they're not putting on film, they don't have this upgrade, they don't have this ability to actually function normally. And it's pretty much statistically proven that after four generations of not putting on film, the fifth generation is not even Jewish anymore. There's, like, there's, there's, no, there's no Judaism left. You're, you're never gonna find four generations in a row that never put on film, there's no, that's it. Maximum four. But we have hundreds of generations of Jewish women and they're all still Jewish. The lack of film <laughs> has no way inhibited them. And the women who today, today decided they have to put on film are no more observant, in fact, quite the contrary. <laughs> so, this is a, a heart mind mitzvah, a consciousness mitzvah, and it's about being able to pull together the human functionality. Now, I want to step back for a moment, after we filled in this understanding of tefillin, I want to talk about the the mitzvah, the actual mitzvah. What is the actual mitzvah? And I want to share with you a very profound insight, very, very profound jurisprudence from probably the greatest Jewish mind of the 20th century. But certainly the first half of the 20th century. His name is Rabbi Yosef Rosen. And you know, those who know will tell you that if there's an, an, there's an Einstein-like brain Within the within Torah scholarship in the first half of the twentieth century, it would have been Rabbi Yosef Rosen, and he was known as the Rugged Shover Gorn. The Rugged Shover Gorn was a person who was always writing. He wrote dozens of books. Very few people understand what what he what he meant to say. He was the, a, a, a thinker uh, and the most creative thinker of the highest order. And his his say on Shabbos, his fingers used to hurt him because he wanted to write down the thoughts that were coming to him. He couldn't write down thoughts that were coming to him. The, 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 the light that he, sh that he was able to shed on arcane parts of Torah is astounding. It's astounding. And to him, all of the Torah was all one, one living, breathing organism. Everything was connected. So in all of his writings, he'll reference 50, 60 sources at the same time in just one paragraph and bring it all together. And it could, it'll, it'll, you know, if you spend a few hours, it actually makes perfect sense. It's very difficult to read. Very, very difficult to read. So actually, the Rebbe corresponded with him using a pen name. Mm -hmm. Rogat Shavu thought he was talking to a, 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 a senior scholar and the other was a teenager. Like, uh, this is like, they were arguing with Rogat Shavu. It's like a running argument when he was a teenager. So the Rogat Shavu says like this. He says, I want to tell you that the truth is there's a big difference between the mitzvah of the hand tefillin and the mitzvah of the head tefillin. 
It's a big difference. What does that mean when he says a difference in the mitzvah? Let's not talk about this philosophically, mystically, spiritually. When the Ravid Shavar Gohan says there's a difference between the mitzvah of hand tefillin and head tefillin, what is he referring to? The Ravid Shavar Gohan did not speak in terminology of mysticism. He spoke in legalese. Everything he speaks about is technical. The legal jurisprudence of Torah. So when the Ravid Shavar Gohan says there's a difference in the mitzvah, what might he mean? Well, it can mean a separate bracha. It can mean it's a, it is a different mitzvah. And by the way, it actually is considered to be two mitzvahs, according to the Rambam. And Ramban attacks him, and we're going to talk about that today. But when he says it's a separate kind of mitzvah, what is he saying? Let me explain myself. Let me explain myself. He might be saying that they are unrelated, or he might be saying that they are related. They're certainly, they're certainly related. They're both called yeah. film. But let me explain myself. If I tell you that there's, there's a mitzvah in the Torah, what's the first order of business that I have? I thought there's a mitzvah in the Torah. The mitzvah is called matzah, for example. What's the first order of business I have in defining the mitzvah to you? What is the matzah? Well, what is the matzah is not what is the mitzvah of matzah. I need to know what when the matzah is. Well, it's still not the mitzvah. What's when the mitzvah? Do? No, when do I eat? What must I do? Yeah. What must I do? In other words, first and foremost, the mitzvah is an action that has to be taken. All of the mitzvahs are actions that have to be taken or not taken. Or not taken. <laughs> all 613 mitzvahs. They're all actions. Some of those actions are actions of the heart. Like, for example, the mitzvah of lusting, or craving, or being jealous, or being having bad thoughts, but it's still an action, a form of action. It's a behavior, if you will. Some of them are not a functional action, some of them are behaviors. But a behavior or an action. So if I tell you that there's a mitzvah to do, the, the burden upon me is to define the mitzvah. So what happens, let's say matzah, you all know what matzah is. So a person, takes matzah, and he meditates on the matzah. <laughs> People who do this, you know, looks at the matzah, and he meditates, and then he studies about the matzah, smells the matzah, touches the matzah, she passes around the table for everybody to touch the matzah. It's a huge matzah night. But nobody eats any matzah. Mm. Did anybody do the mitzvah? No. Right, but they all, they all like, were inspired by the matzah. <laughs> because it's very nice to be inspired by matzah. And mitzvahs have messages. <laughs> but the mitzvah is to eat the matzah. If you didn't eat the matzah, you didn't do the mitzvah. What is matzah? Great. That's another, it's another definition. That's not a definition of what is the mitzvah. That is a definition of what are the, art, the ingredients required for the mitzvah. So if I tell you there's a mitzvah to blow the shofar, did I say the truth? Is there a mitzvah to blow the shofar? No. No, there's no mitzvah to blow the shofar. There's a mitzvah to hear the shofar. And what's the and what's the proof? What's the proof? Because in the bracha we don't say Asher kedushanu b'mitzvah of itzivano litkoa the shofar, but rather it says lishmoa. Right. Now, correspondingly, when we have a mitzvah to listen to the megillah, actually the mitzvah is to read the megillah. Yeah. That's why the bracha is not al shmiat megillah, but rather al mikra megillah. Well, in that case, then ask me the question. How does anybody fulfill the mitzvah? Yeah. Except for the person who's reading it. And the answer is, in Judaism, we have something called an agency, called shlichus. Mm. And shlichus means somebody can act in my stead. And therefore, if the person reading the Megillah is not obligated in the Megillah, I won't fulfill the mitzvah. Because the reader is actually yeah. my shliach, my agent. Do you know there's a mitzvah in the Torah to sanctify the Shabbat when it arrives? Mm -hmm. Mitzvah in the Torah. So why does one person make Kiddush? Everybody should make Kiddush. The answer is, you can do it by yourself, or you can have somebody do it on your behalf. But when you listen to the Kiddush being made, when you answer Amen, you're fulfilling the mitzvah of making Kiddush. Mm -hmm. Not listening to Kiddush, not watching the Kiddush. And so it is, we could, we could spend all night here going through different mitzvahs that you're familiar with, and we can analyze and highlight exactly what is the mitzvah. So since we mentioned matzah, it would be important for me to point out that there's a certain amount that has to be eaten and a certain amount of time in which it has to be eaten. And if you didn't eat a certain amount of matzah in a certain amount of time, you didn't fulfill the mitzvah. So if you nibbled matzah all night long, you didn't fulfill the mitzvah. 
Incidentally, let's talk about a mitzvah of something that you're not allowed to do. We talked about eating matzah, so give me a mitzvah that's like eating matzah, but a negative mitzvah. Not eating chametz. Not eating chametz. So what happens if a person nibbled a tiny drop of chametz? So the truth is, is lo kol machmetzet lo tochelu. But to actually violate the mitzvah fully, you have to eat Kazait. a kezayit. Oh. Or if a person is going to eat on Yom Kippur, when the Torah says, don't eat on Yom Kippur, in order for a person to fully violate Yom Kippur, how much would you have to eat? Kazait. A little more. Kaseves, kaseves a little more. Yeah, it's in between. A little more than a kezayit, like, like a date, like a full date. Why? The reason is, the reason is because kezayit is a serving. So when you have to eat a serving, but on Yom Kippur, it's not about eating a serving, it's about being satiated. Experiencing temporary satiation. So it's a little more than a kezayit. So therefore, for example, what happens to a person who has to eat on Yom Kippur? Because... To give him something. To give him small amounts and spread it out over the day. a period of time. So if you have very... At least then, you didn't violate the Torah fully. You're doing the best you could. This is what the Torah is all about mitzvahs. Okay, now let me go back to what I was saying. If I'm going to tell you that the Raghat Shavagon says there's a difference between the mitzvah of the hand film and the mitzvah of the head film, what, what am I saying? What is, what is the Raghat Shavagon saying to us? Well, hand is action. He's like gonna, head is internal. Yes, head, hand is action internal. Interesting you say that, but what he was going to say is that the action taken to fulfill the hand mitzvah and the action taken to fulfill the head mitzvah are actually not one and the same. What does this mean? Listen to what he says. I'm reading to you. With regard to the hand filling, ha mitzvah, you listening carefully? Ha mitzvah, he ha hanocha. The mitzvah is the placement, or he says possibly the kashira, the tying. But the head tefillin, ha mitzvah. What is the mitzvah? Sheyihi emunach. That the tefillin should be there. They should be there. In other words, for the hand tefillin, the mitzvah is the placement. For the head tefillin, the mitzvah is not the placement, but rather they should be there. How they got there is not as important. And he gives us a fascinating example. Do you know? that rabbinically one is not allowed to put on tefillin at night. So when could you start to put on tefillin? There's a certain time in the morning. Daybreak. Daybreak. So what happens if somebody were to put on tefillin before Alon Toshacha? So it depends. The head tefillin that were put on before, as long as they're still on your head, once they broke, you're okay. Even though the act of placing the head tefillin wasn't done appropriately. It was already there. Because there was no act that has to, the film doesn't have to be placed, it has to Just be. Be, be there. But the hand film, you would actually have to move away and return. Because the mitzvah of the hand film is to place the tefillin. To place the tefillin. Then why not two brachot? Oh, one second, very good. Hold it, hold it. Very good question, why not two brachot? Now he says, he gives us an example, he cross-references, he says there's a mitzvah called paraduma. Paraduma means it's certain kind of special water, has to be mixed with certain kind of special ashes, and then this is sprinkled, the mixture is sprinkled, and people came in contact with the dead, and they become ritually pure. pure. So it says that the mayim, the water, is mitkachim, the matan eifa, when you place the ashes. So what happens if the wind blows the ashes into the water? Nothing. It doesn't work, because you have to actually place it. You have to place it. And now, here's a fascinating little possibility of a difference, a practical difference. Now, this is a very practical difference. This is something I taught my children very early on because my boys started to help people put on film before their bar mitzvah, wow. all of them. So I said to them, you could do that, but you have to get the person to actually tie the tefillin of the hand by himself. Why? Because the child doesn't have the mitzvah. So if the child ties the tefillin, he can't be a shliach, he can't be an agent. If I, if I tie the tefillin for you, I'm a grown, I'm, I'm grown, I'm obligated in the mitzvahs, so I could do that. But if the child, the child, my children learned, I taught them they have to go, you tie it, you tighten it by yourself, and then they would do the wrapping, that's not a problem. But the actual tightening, you have to do by yourself. The head tefillin they could place, why? Because the mitzvah is not the placement, the mitzvah is the? Being. Location. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Then the Raghat says like this, he says, 
And this explains to us the language that's used when we recite a blessing before putting on the tefillin. Namely, when we put on the hand film, the bracha we recite is lahaniach. Lahaniach means to place. However, when you put on the head film, the bracha which is made al mitzvah, on the mitzvah, not on the mitzvah of placing. Because there is no mitzvah to put on the head film. You only say that if you interrupt the process. process. We'll talk about the two blessings. We'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Because he says, the bishal rosh, lo hanacha hiya mitzvah. It's not the placement that's the mitzvah, rather, it should have been placed. It should be in place, not the placement. Okay. He says, though, the Raghat Shavar does say cryptically that nonetheless there is a connection because the Gemara tells us in Menachas, whenever you have it on your head, you should have it on your hand also. So there is a little bit of a connection between hand and head. The hand paves the way for the head to go on, but there's a difference in the way the mitzvah is performed. Are you following me so far? I just shared with you a very deep idea in the concept of jurisprudence, which is called le the legal philosophy of the way this mitzvah is done. So far so good? Mm -hmm. so. The Rebbe, in one of his sikhs, points out that the words of the Rogachavar are actually, it seems, based on the scripture itself. Because in Pasha's Ve'eschanan, which is the source for the mitzvah of putting on tefillin, the Torah says, look inside again, chapter 6, verse 8, when the Torah describes this mitzvah, the details of this mitzvah, what does the Torah say? Ukshartam. What does ukshartam mean? Tie. You should tie. Le'otal yadecha. And then when it talks about the tefillin on the head, it doesn't say ukshartam. What does it say? Vahayu. 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 That's, I'm still... On that question. The means both ultimately. We'll talk about that. Ultimately, it means both. Ultimately. No, but in, uh, here it says Vahaya. Yes. Earlier it says Vahaya, but, here, but uh, uh, that refers to the Ot. That refers to the sign which Rashi says is going on inside. Okay. But let's go back here now. So the Rebbe says, take a look at the verse. What the Raghat Shavar is saying makes perfect sense with the actual scripture because the scripture uses the terminology of Ukshartam and Vahayu Latotafot. Now, the Rebbe says there is a famous dispute between Rambam and Ramban. Maimonides and Nachmanides. Rabbeinu Moshe ben Maiman, Rabbeinu Moshe ben Nachman. What's the dispute? The Rambam says it's two separate mitzvahs. Now, let me fill you in here. We know that there are 630 mitzvahs. There's no question about that. The Gemara in Makkot at the end says there are 611 were given through Moshe, two were given through God. We know that there are 630 mitzvahs. We also know what has to be done. There really isn't a dispute in amongst all of our sages with tens of thousands of disputes. There really isn't much of a dispute of what has to be done. Everybody knows you have to put on hand film, for example, head film. What, what kind of disputes did our sages have? Our rabbis, later looking back at the words of the sages, they said, our sages told us how many mitzvahs there are, but they never told us how they got to that number. They never told us how we get to the magic number. So if we start counting all the mitzvahs, there actually could be well over 2,000 mitzvahs. But the question is, what is considered a mitzvah and what's considered a tributary, a detail in a mitzvah? So for example, Rambam writes a book of mitzvahs in which he explains, he gives you 14 rules, which interestingly correspond to the 14 books of Mishnah Torah. And he says, here's the 14 principles I use to deduce or to adduce which are the actual 613. Mm -hmm. Nachmanides came along and he said, I disagree with many of the things. So instead of writing his own book of mitzvahs, he wrote glosses on the Ramah's book of mitzvahs. He, when he argues, he argues. And in the back, he says, oh, here's how I make up the 613. So Nachmanides comes along and he says, I don't understand the Rambam. Why did he make the hand film and the head film two separate mitzvahs? They're one mitzvah. It's a mitzvah of tefillin. And the Rambam himself says, if I made a bracha on the hand filling, I don't have to make a bracha on the head film unless I speak in between, unless I make an interruption. So Nachmanides says, you yourself say that it's the same bracha. How do you make two mitzvahs? So you're going to say, what do you mean? They're two separate things. The hand film look one way, the head film looks another way. He says, Nachmanides, we have a mitzvah of tzitzit. You mentioned the talisman. Tzitzit, we have white threads. And really, the 
you're supposed to have through tchelet, the blue threads. We don't have the blue threads. The big dispute about that, I don't want to get into that now. Right? Some people think they know what it is. There's at least already two opinions what the tchelet are, and then there's the majority opinion of most observant Jews who say, we don't know what it is, so you know, we're not going to go there. So one second, let me ask you a question. Where, where many, all observant Jews are wearing tzitzit, mm -hmm. how can you wear the white without the blue? The answer is, really they're two separate things, but if you can do half, you do half, it's also something. Are they two separate things, or are they're they... They're not two separate mitzvahs. They're not two separate mitzvahs. But they're two separate things. Well, they're two separate mitzvahs, and this is the, the, the point. We say, Lovan v'tchilat einan ma'akvim ze'ezeh. They don't override one another. Exclusive. They don't cancel, not mutually exclusive. You can have one without the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so Ramban says in that case, and it's considered one mitzvah, it's not two mitzvahs and tzitzis, one mitzvah. So it's the same thing with head fill and hand fill. It's one mitzvah. You're doing half of it. You're doing half of it. No. Half of it, a person doesn't have a hand. What do you do? Put on your head. So this is a famous question that Ramban asks. How, how, how could Ramban say that it's two mitzvahs? Mm -hmm. Says the Rebbe, thanks to Rabbi Ragachover, Rabbi Rosen, now we have an answer. Why are they two different mitzvahs? Because they're two different mitzvahs. <laughs> because each mitzvah, what is a mitzvah? A mitzvah is the action that should be taken. The behavior that's required. The hand phone require tying, ukshartam, lahaniach, and the head phone require it should be there. So uh, they clip. But there, there's no action in being. In, in, just, in, in just presence. Ain hachinami. There is no action there. So that mitzvah doesn't require an action. Technically, you have to put it there. But in theory, if you could have a robot placing its phone on your head. Yeah. So there's no action, a, there's no, you'd there's be no fine. mitzvah. There's a Gemara that talks about... No, a, but there's a, no action, no mitzvah. No, with a hand film will be no mitzvah. With a head film, there would be a mitzvah. Without an action? Yes. The Gemara, the Gemara, there's a Gemara that talks about an orangutan doing something. What if you train an orangutan to put the film on the person's head? head you never... Head. Orangutans definitely don't have mitzvahs. Yeah, but the, the filling is there, it's fine. No. Point made, exactly. If the orangutan puts the mitzvah on the hand... You don't have a mitzvah. No. If the orangutan puts a mitzvah fill on your head, you do have a mitzvah. You don't have to use an orangutan. You're a child. The child, the child, the child, the child, the child tied the fill on the hand. Didn't get the mitzvah. But it's on the head. But on that, you do have the mitzvah. It's it has to be two separate mitzvahs. Yes. From Rambam's perspective, by the way, the Rogachover's uh, Torah is on the Rambam. He's he 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 comes to this through the Rambam. So so therefore, it's obviously two separate mitzvahs. So far, so good? Mm -hmm. okay. So if there are two separate mitzvahs, then the question we might well ask then is, so why actually are there two separate mitzvahs? Why is one something that has to just be done, and in theory, once I tied the hand phone, I fulfilled the mitzvah. So once I tied the hand phone, in theory, I can take it right off, the mitzvah's done. But the head phone, it has to be there for a while. Because it's not the placing, it's the being. Now, to be sure, the Gemara does say that calls man that as long as you're wearing tefillin on your head, you should also have tefillin on your hand as well. Okay, so then the, t the hand tefillin at that point is being placed for which purpose? For the purpose of the, for the, purpose the, head. Of the head. It's serving the head tefillin, so to speak. Mm -hmm. The hand tefillin are there for the sake of making the head tefillin right, but not for the sake of, its, of it itself. It becomes a detail in, the, in that mitzvah. So they're obviously interconnected these mitzvahs. So what happens if you don't have an arm? What happens if you don't have you an arm? Then the you put the phone just on your head? But you need the arm to put it on the other one. No, somebody can put an arm. Or somebody else will put it on. Well, if you don't, if you don't have an arm, if you don't have an arm, you can't put on phone. A lot of people never put on an amputee, can't put on phone. But, they, know but they can the put on the head phone. On the head phone. You do the mitzvah of the head? That's right. Yeah. And then somebody else can put it on your head. Okay, so the Rebbe, the Rebbe says that we basically have two kinds of mitzvahs. We have mitzvahs that are an action that's taken at a certain time, a certain, we do a mitzvah, and then we have mitzvahs that have a continuous effect. Which is the more powerful of the two mitzvahs? Let me give you an example. If you affixed a mezuzah to your door and then took it right down, did you really fulfill the mitzvah? Well, you fulfilled the mitzvah, but... Uh, uh, you missed the point of the mitzvah. Yeah. And the point of the mitzvah, if a, if, a, if, a, if a year is living in a house without mezuzahs, it's a problem. Yeah. Because the idea... Of, the, 
You have to affix it. You have to affix it, but it has to remain affixed afterwards. It has to remain affixed. The idea is the idea of the of the of the of the of the mezuzah is that the that the mezuzah should be on your doorpost and it has a paula timidit. There are certain mitzvahs we fulfill constantly. If a Jew is traveling and he's not in his or her house, but there's mezuzahs on his or her doors, guess what? You have the protection that mezuzah brings you, even if you're not in the house right now, or touching the mezuzah or looking at the mezuzah right now. Why? Because your house has the mezuzah. It's it's what we call a state of being. It's a state of being. It, it has a continuous influence on you. These are called mitzvahs to dira. Like there's a mitzvah to love Hashem. When should you love Hashem? Only when you daven? All the time. Or should you love Hashem all the time? So there are mitzvahs that we do in order to help us to nurture and curate that love. And the Rebbe suggests that the mitzvah of tefillin shal is a more profound mitzvah, a more powerful of the two mitzvahs because it stays. It stays. Because it remains. With this, the Rebbe answers a very famous question as to why the Rambam talks first about the head tefillin and only what's after about the hand tefillin. And he suggests because the head tefillin are the more prominent of the two. Why? Because the head tefillin is temporary and the hand tefillin has a lasting impact. The question that we haven't answered at all yet is, what's behind this? Why should the hand tefillin just be tied? And why should the head tefillin have to be placed? And why do the hand and head later have this relationship where in order for the head to be right, the hand has to be in place. So I want to share with you now an incredible teaching, an incredible mystical teaching from the Rebbe based on this rub each other. And once we have clarity on this teaching, I think we're going to go back to the Rashi and the Rashi will make perfect sense to us. Mm -hmm. And it will even explain to us why Rashi and Shemot used certain limitations. But let, let me first share this teaching with you. Going back to something we started before the Ravichari, where we, we demonstrated that the hand tefillin are connected to the heart, and the head tefillin are connected to the mind. Together, heart and mind, together, create what we know as human consciousness. So, the reason we put on tefillin, connected halev, is something called shibud halev. The quote the, 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 in the writings of our sages, according to the Shulchan Aruch, l'shabed l'hakadosh baruch hu halev, that we should subjugate. subjugate our heart to Hashem, which the heart is ikra taivas v'machshavas, people's thoughts, people's designs, people's desires, people's lusts, people's interests. It's an heart, so we want to subjugate. And why do we put the tefillin on the head to subjugate the mind, the consciousness, the neshama, if you will? which is a, a, a word used freely, I think, for consciousness, right? The person, and sometimes you say the person's not there. The person, like the neshama. So why is it that the hand fill-in is comprised of one box, one, one compartment with one parchment, and the head fill-in has four compartments of four different things, right? So obviously there's a big difference between what we call reigning in the heart and reigning in the mind. There's got to be a big difference. Think about this carefully. Mm -hmm. Say you like chocolate. No problem. You like chocolate? No problem. You like chocolate. <laughs> and that's your nature. Why, why do you like chocolate? I don't know. They like chocolate. Nobody really understands why they like one taste or another taste. Maybe it was conditioning. Maybe it's nature. I don't know. Whatever. You like something. Say you like something which is not permitted. Say you like pork. You like pork. How would you know? <laughs> Maybe you weren't always observant. Maybe you once ate pork. You really like it. You have a desire for it. Does that make you a bad Jew? Does that make you a bad Jew if you no. eat pork? No, actually. Absolutely not. No. no? The ability no. to resist it actually makes you better. In fact, it's quite possible that somebody who craves pork is doing a much bigger mitzvah by not eating it. You know that famous story that I shared with you from Professor Velvo Green when he wanted the hot dog? Right, and he had these cravings back and forth. And he finally didn't eat the hot dog. And then he wrote to the Rebbe about it. And the Rebbe wrote him back, Velvo, your relationship with Hashem began when you stopped, when you finally decided not to eat the hot dog. 
So I never had the privilege of having a relationship with Hashem because of Ahato, because I never had a desire for Ahato. <laughs> right? People who say, ah, my God is bigger than a hot dog, Rabbi. Like, uh, I, my God is into social justice. My God is not into hot dogs. So I'm like, yeah, that's nice, but you're not bigger than hot dogs. And, and because you're not, and God wants a relationship with you, so therefore God's relationship with you, because you crave hot dogs, is with your pork hot dog or whatever else it is. And when you say no to that hot dog, that's when you have a relationship. And if it's not hard for you to say no to the hot dog because you don't even like hot dogs, that's fine. Then that's, fine. that's not where you're getting your relationship from. Where does your relationship come from? Your relationship comes from somewhere else. Can people really change their feelings? Can yeah. people... I'm not sure. Condition, yeah. I'm not sure if you can condition yourself. It's quite eminently possible that a person will go through life always craving hot dogs. Craving. <laughs> that are not kosher. It's, part, it part, and it's quite possible that the kosher market will not come up with a good substitute. Or they come up with a substitute, That's and the person expensive. grumbles and says, oh, you're <laughs> and, then, and like the film people will say, oh, this mock crab is fantastic. And the person who actually loves crab is crazy. This is, this is so not crab, but whatever. It makes you feel good. You keep chewing your salmon, you know, like that. <laughs> Is it reasonable for a person to say, you know, I've been in this with God for 20 years now. I used to eat crab. I don't eat crab anymore. Enough! I don't want to have a love for crab anymore. Is that, is that, is that okay? For, can a person expect necessarily to change? No? I don't think so. You can't necessarily change your heart. Can well, there is conditioning. People can be conditioned to this or to that. Attitude. People can be conditioned, maybe, to a degree. And at the end of the day, it still may catch their attention. It's still, they still, they still may notice. True. It's still, it still grabs their eyes. True. They see it, it still grabs their eyes. And what do they have to do? They have to control themselves. There's a huge controversial issue now. Mm -hmm. Huge. This is, this is probably the biggest controversial issue that's exploding all over the place over the last few months. And that's about people are trying to normalize. Mm -hmm. I, I actually say this with revulsion, but they're nor trying to normalize pedophilia. Huh? What? It's, it's, it's like all over the place now. They're trying to join all the other revolutions. And, and one of the things they say is, we didn't, like, we didn't ask to be this way. We didn't want to have this desire. That's what we desire. It, it, to, to the normal person, it doesn't make sense. Wow. Now, I'm not sure what they expect exactly. Mm -hmm. So what do they want? Yeah. Right? So, so far, at least, thank God, Western civilization looks at that with utter revulsion and disgust. And it's called child abuse. Well, they used to Criminal look. They abuse. used to look at that way. At uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not as well. Maybe fine. Sure. Fine. So the question is: Are they planning to change this? Well, you know, keep they, Trudeau. Keep Trudeau. And I ask this question very seriously. Now, here is. I wanted to. I wanted to hear the point. Is it is possible that a person should have these cravings? I mean, clearly there are people who have cravings like this. If you ask me, I would say they're sick people. They have a sickness. They have an illness. This. 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 There is an origin in the brain where these, cra these cravings come from, yeah. these sick cravings. Yeah. It's a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. It's okay. part of the hypothalamus. And um, it's the same place where pleasure from aggression originates. Wow. Okay, so there's a certain part of the brain that I assume releases serotonin in, in a certain way when a person has pleasure and the person's brain is wired that way. So it is possible, it is possible from a Torah perspective, it's possible that somebody should have such an unhealthy craving. It's the same place where sadomasochism comes from. Okay, sadomasochism, another revolting, sickening behavior. So what should somebody do if I they hope they have, don't parade down Young Street. What should somebody do if they have a craving for this? What should they do? They have to restrain yourself. That's what you have to do. Control yourself. But I want, never, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Why did God give this to me? I can't explain that I'm not God. I'm in sales, not management. I, I, I don't know. What, what I can tell you is what to do. What to do? Do what Hashem wants. Is it possible that the craving <coughs> will always be there? Nope. Yeah? It's possible. Uh, most of us don't understand that craving. Why would you want that? It's not, it's, it's not normal. We don't understand it. It doesn't mean I, I'm not going to judge a person. I'm not going to look down at a person. I can pity a person. I can have compassion for a person. But here's one thing I'm not prepared to do. Sacrifice children. So this person to have pleasure. That's not okay. It's not okay, ever. So what I mean to say is that when it comes to the desires of the heart and everybody 
may have his or her unhealthy desires. It's very possible. Everybody can have unhealthy desires. And it doesn't make you bad, dirty, or ugly, or ungodly. It just makes you human. And why would God give somebody unhealthy desires? Or desires which can lead a person to sin? The answer would be, because Hashem clearly thinks that this is what you need to perfect your soul by restraining. Self-restraint. Judaism is, is based on self-restraint. You can't eat whatever you want. You can't go whatever you want. You can't do whatever you want. We have all kinds of restrictions. What are these restrictions designed for? To make us better people. And the Ramam says, to fix our attitudes, to guide our behavior. And it is eminently possible that a person will never be able to change the desires of his heart. Alta never talks about it in Tanya, great lens. <laughs> the desires are desires. The human being is a human being. What are you supposed to do then? Rein it in? Tie it down. Lock it up. So the Rebbe suggests this is the idea of the Tfilon Shalyad. What's about the Tfilon Shalyad? The Tfilon Shalyad, what's expected of you? Clamp it down. The Yitzhahara wants, choke him. Don't let him. The Tfilon Shalyad, he says, when it comes to Midas Shabalev, Ein libe shal adam Here the Alter Rebbe quotes the Tanya, Tanya Perikid Zayin, which we just learned a few weeks ago in our class. The, the Alter Rebbe says a person's heart is not within his own domain or jurisdiction. It's not his heart. A person has a phobia. He's, he's afraid. He's, he's fearful of heights. He may not be able to overcome that. He may always be uncomfortable with heights. So who says he has to work on, on a skyscraper? That's not a, probably not a good job for him. Or he shouldn't sign up to the circus and look, I'm a tightrope walker. And a person who has a terror of speaking publicly, <clears throat> so don't speak publicly. <laughs> Afraid to do, don't do it. Somebody called me up recently. He says, how do you do it? How do you do it? He says, more than three people I can't open my mouth. I'm terrified. How do you do it? Teach me how to do it. I said, I don't think I can. You said, gotta confront your fears. You can't. I don't know if you have to confront yeah. your fears, but if a person has a fear of speaking publicly, you must force him to speak publicly. Don't speak publicly. It's a mitzvah to speak publicly. If that's not, you're a shy person. You're a shy. Allowed to be shy. Of to torture people. It's a mitzvah to go force them to do things that they hate. No. Deal with it. I mean, it's easy for you to say deal with it. You're not shy. There are shy people. People who really are shy, you get tongue tied if they have to speak in front of more than a few people. They're terrified. Rabbi, was there ever a time in your development? in your life cycle that you had a reluctance and a fear of speaking publicly? Father O'Malley, what else would you like to know? <laughs> but, since, but since you asked, but since you asked, I am going to tell you, but this, should, this should inspire everybody who is afraid to speak publicly. When I was a teenager, mm -hmm. until a certain point, I was absolutely terrified wow. of doing anything publicly. Wow. But you confronted it. Yeah, but I had it you in me. You turned the problem into I an had opportunity. It, I had it in me. I didn't, not everybody has it in them. I was so terrified that I was 14 years old, mm -hmm. and my teacher said, go be the chazan. And I was terrified to be good the chazan. Good teacher. Yeah, I was not a good teacher, because he forced me, and we had a showdown, <laughs> and I didn't do it. And he did not understand that I was, a sh I was just too afraid to do it. And he threw me out of school for it. And look what happened. Yeah. It did not from then. I did not speak publicly until I was 18. And then, whatever. I just so I had a little bit of phobia and then I just got rid of it. No, but, but you have to have it. I'm just saying it. Some people could shed that kind of fear. Some people can shed that kind of fear. It's not expected that everybody will shed every fear. It's not fear to expect that. Does every person have to work on top of a skyscraper? I couldn't do it. I don't have to do it. I don't know. There are people who see blood, they faint. Should they yes. become a surgeon? It's a mitzvah. You must be a Mohel rabbi because you see blood. There you're risking somebody else. That's another <laughs> ah, story. Now the Rebbe says when it comes to the heart, it's Eini belibe shal adam b'rishusay lahapech leiv mitavis ilam hazah. La'avas Hashem be'emes. And even people who manage to rein in and elevate and, and, and sublimate their personalities, guess what? They still don't love God or godly activity as much as love chocolate cake. When chocolate cake is brought in the room, this the ears still perk up, and when another hour of davening is offered, they don't necessarily go right. <laughs> right on. Why not? You should love the daven like you love chocolate cake because he says, "What do you want from me? I'm human." I davened that hour. I didn't eat the cake. It wasn't kosher. I did it, but it doesn't mean I wasn't interested in doing it, or that I was interested in doing this. You could even develop a taste for davening. You could even enjoy davening. I do a little bit. 
Not as much as chocolate cake. <laughs> so that's the idea of the Tfilin Shalyat, the Shibud Halev. What is the Shibud Halev? You can't expect it to stay there. You're going to change yourself. What do you do? <coughs> Tie it. Maisak Shira. That's it. And then what do you do tomorrow? Tie it down again. And what do you do the next day? Again. Spend your whole life tying it down. Mm-hmm. You keep restraining. But you're tying your arm. Understood. Yeah. You're, tying, you're, you're tying You're tying tefillin. You're not actually tying anything yeah. down. Yeah. You're, you're doing an your action. Your you're tying tefillin to onto your arm so that's near your heart. It's your the heart. action that's required. The yeah. Rebbe says, you know why an action is required? Because we're dealing with shibud. Halev. It's a good question. It's a, it's a, no, Chav asks a very good question. Yeah. Why not strap the tefillin to your heart? True. It's a good question. So first of all, because the Torah doesn't say it. Right? But the answer for that would be primarily because Judaism is an action-oriented religion. Mm-hmm. It's actually not about tying it to the heart. It's actually about tying it to the hands, hands because the cravings in the heart lead to the actions that are taken. Yeah. And if we don't change a person's heart, that's okay. Judaism never said it's bad to have cravings. Judaism said it's bad to do something about the cravings. It's not evil if a person has pedophilic desires. It's abnormal. It's not evil. It's evil if a person who has those desires harms a child. That's what's sick and evil. So evil is acting out on that. And the person who nebuch has these cravings, what should they do? I don't know, go to a doctor. You have mental illness. Figure out how to deal with your mental illness. It's a mental illness. I said, well, I had to use the child. I couldn't control myself. Baloney. You have no right to harm a child ever. Ever. It's pure evil. What was pure evil? Not the desire, the lack of restraint. (laughs) Judaism is about Hamaisa hu ha'ikr. And that's really and truly Chava. That's the answer to your question. Where does the tefillin have to go? Uh-huh. On the hand. Because what does the hand represent? <laughs> that's Taka the point. However, when it comes to the mind, you can change your mind. Mm-hmm. People change their mind every day? Mm-hmm. How do you change a person's mind? Just Education. <laughs> it can be for bad or for good. How are these monsters getting radicalized? Because they're being radicalized, that's why. Because they're being fed this lunacy, this craziness. Fascism in their brain, like, like poison in their brain. And they pick up guns and shoot people afterwards. And then they are they a little crazy? Yeah, they're probably a little crazy. But last time I checked, people who are a little crazy don't go cold-bloodedly shoot children. Maybe they shoot themselves. But this is a result of fascist in- indoctrination. And education can change people. That's what Judaism believes. We believe in education. The whole Judaism is about education. The Rebbe dedicated his life to education. Because you can change people's minds. You can rarify, sublimate, upgrade, and transform a person's way of thinking. And that's why the tilling of the head has to be replaced. replaced. It's not enough to rein your mind in when you have a crazy thought. You need to train your mind. You need to educate. You need to focus. You need to channel your mind appropriately. That is not a one-time thing. That's a lifetime of endeavor. Here, the Rebbe says a murder dika thing. The Rebbe says, it's explained in Chassidus that there are two kinds of intellect, two levels of intellect. There's something called chitzayni yasamaychen and something called pnimi yasamaychen. Chitzayni means the mind in a superficial way. Pneumia Samaychen means an interchange. So there's what I can now, I'm going to think about this. That's a superficial change. Or I've changed my mind to the point that that's what I think of. That's my way, my mind, this is how I think of things. Big difference. First, you come, I have a phobia. Okay, think about this now. If you think about this, it'll calm you down. Think calming thoughts. I'm getting very nervous. I need some Samfra. Think this X, Y, and Z, this strategies of thinking, this is a Chitzayin means the inner rhythm is where I train my mind to look at things in a Torah way. When your person learns Torah, you become a Torah mind. How you look at things through a Torah prism. And when you have a, a change, an inner transformation in the mind, where it's not just something I'm, excuse me, actively thinking about as a strategy to deal with something, 
but I actually changed my mind, invariably, it can, to some degree, filter through to the heart. It can, to some degree. So the Rebbe says, this is why the head tefillin, after they remain on your head, what else has to be in place? Because to some degree, we can change the way we feel about things. But that's where the hand is subsumed into the tefillin of the head. That's when the head takes the lead. So the first thing you gotta do is rein in what you're doing. First thing you do, first it is, rein it in. First thing we start with the tone of the head. And when you first rein it in, then ultimately you can educate and sublimate yourself to the point that you become transformed. I found something fascinating in the writings of the Rebbe's father, in his Chidushim of Yerom Shas. The Rebbe's father suggests, quote, the fact that the Torah first states tie the hand phone, and in fact the halacha says we have to first put on the hand phone, and all the afterwards the head phone, who al derech this is kemoi hakdomas nase lenishma. When the Jewish people said first we will obey, and then we will listen. Because of this, they merited not one crown, but two crowns. And the says, The tefillin is like a crown. Hashem who crowns us in glory, which refers to the tefillin. And that's why in the morning of the Tisha we, take, we don't put the tefillin on because you can't wear a crown. It says, your, your glory has been taken from you. But really, it's, you end up with two crowns. Which two crowns? You get a crown for Nasa also. Which this, 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 this little pithy manuscript, it's exactly what the Rebbe is explaining over here. So why not, why not on Tisha B'Av just the, uh, the, the well, tefillin of Yad? Because we never just do the tefillin of Yad. Naisa, doing, has to always be followed by Nishma. In Judaism, action has to be followed by education. Obedience has to come along with re-education as well. Right. Always. But without obedience, you can't, you can't learn Torah. And that's why we said, as long as it's on your head, you have to have Yerushnayim. Yeah, I can't say, ah, yeah, I eat whatever I want, I do whatever I want, but I like to learn Torah. Mm-hmm. That's all wrong. First, you've got to rein yourself in. And when you have Naisa, obedience, then you have Nishma. Now let's go back to the Rashi we started off. Rashi says, Ukshartem lo'isal yodecha. Ukshartem lo'isal yodecha. You have to tie it on your hand. Rashi explains, Elo, this is the tefillin. Shebizroya, think about what we learned tonight. What's Rashi really answering is the words, Ukshartem and Vahoyu. You know why it says, Ukshartem lo Isal Yodecha? Because Elu Tfilin Shebizroya, this is the Tfilin of the hand. The Tfilin of the hand have to be tied on. That's one kind of mitzvah. Vahoyu, they should be. They, meaning even the hand, Tfilin and the hand, that should be. But that refers, Elu, this is primarily Tfilin. And that's Elu, it's, 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 it's Vahayu is plural. Now go back to, to the Exodus thing. What does it say over here? In Exodus, it doesn't speak about the performance of the mitzvah. In Exodus, it speaks about what will be. Mm-hmm. They will be. Vahayu l'chala'is. It will be for you as a sign. It will be Yod chal zikar necha. There, Rashi emphasizes what first? He says, Tik shalem b'roish u because which part of tefillin is he talking about now? The second dimension of tefillin. Mm-hmm. Not the reigning in, but rather how they function together in unison. V'tik shireim. Both of them, tying them both together. Because here it's b'roish u with a mind which ultimately then dominates the heart. And that's why Rashi reverses the order because here in Pasha's bow, we're speaking about the end result of tefillin. He's speaking about a different dimension of tefillin. And what this really tells us, even though this was a class about the Parsha, and if you will, a class about tefillin, what this really helps us to understand is Judaism's take on what Hashem expects from us. Hashem expects us, A, to do the right thing and not do the wrong thing. But He also expects us to immerse ourselves in holy and lofty ideas, to educate ourselves constantly, which is the idea of Talmud Torah constantly, and that the ultimate goal of constant education and Torah study is to, in a subtle way, even if not totally transform the heart, but to, in a subtle way, to channel the heart more appropriately as well. Mm-hmm. To some degree, not entirely, you can't change the heart altogether, but to some degree, even the emotions, even the lust, cravings, and desires can be mitigated, mm-hmm. can be brought under control because a person is studying Torah. In fact, the Rambam says about a person who has 
cravings, unhealthy and toxic sexual desires, the Rambam says he should dedicate his energies to Torah study. And that will enable him to channel his energy appropriately, which is basically what we're saying. That's the Tefillin Shorosh. That's the Torah's answer. That's the Torah answer. And we live in a world, Nebuch, unfortunately, a world that mocks Torah study, that mocks any kind of lofty spiritual education. So what do you expect? A world gone crazy, a world that has no inhibition, a world that doesn't believe in any kind of restraint, a world that, that's uh, Meshuggah, a world that the only thing the world still believes in is kindness. Thank God. It still believes in compassion, even though today the compassion is misplaced. Now they have more compassion that com more compassion for the perpetrator of the crime than for the victims of the crime. The whole twisted kind of compassion. But but this is the problem. Torah, Yiddishkeit wants us to change ourselves. Hashem expects us to change ourselves. And the fact that we're born with certain tendencies or desires, if they're unhealthy, if they're not what the Torah wants, work with it. Nobody said it's easy. And nobody's the right to judge anybody. But at the end of the day, if you wonder what Torah Judaism has to say, what does Torah want from us? That's what Torah expects of us. And incidentally, if you think this is a little deal, the Balaturim, I'll finish off with this, says that what happens in, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, what happens right after the tying of the tefillin? What's the very next verse? He says, Tefillin, mezuzah, what's next? God will bring you to the land of Israel. He says, the Balaturim says, do you know why it comes one after the other? Because in the merit of Torah study, of Tefillin and Torah and Mezuzah, the Jewish people will be able to go into the land of Israel. We all love Israel. We all want Israel to be strong. We all want Israel to be established and to be, and, and we want it to be further established for the stronger. My dear friends, Yiddishkeit is the answer. But we will live as we should live. HaKadosh Baruch will help us that things will go as we want it to be. And hopefully, very speedily, and in our days, as a result of more tefillin, more mezuzah, more teira, more Yiddishkeit, will merit the grand return to Eretz saw led by Mashiach, the teira will be a manual. Amen. 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 So, the next two weeks are going to be focused on, I'm doing a three-part uh, tefillin now. Okay, three part. So I'm going to go into the four compartments. I'm going to give you a whole class about that. And a whole class about so. I, I figured we're going to do this once and for all. Go through like mm -hmm. so. Next week's parsha. It also mentions tefillin actually. So we'll be next week. Also be a parsha class, and then we'll do a third uh, follow up. So I have a three part series. Well, why is the result? Ahead? I have before you ask your question. I want to ask you a question. Yeah, but why? Just is the be, be honest. Ahead? Was it worth waiting, everybody? Yeah. Yes. Well, why is the yeah. result? Yeah. Why is the it's result? Is it good? I tied it up first. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Why is the result ahead of the uh, ahead of the answer? Thank you for waiting and, and thank you for joining. Really. Uh, see an open one? Like, see it's going? Yeah. I can show you it's going. Okay. Go to the one who checks it.